I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us here live and everybody who's joining us on the recording for this, our eighth episode of Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. It's hosted by Gary Weber and Rich Doyle. We're very grateful to both of them for making the time to come here again, to come to, together again and, and do this with us. It's great to have you both here and everyone joining us. And this is, as you know, a question-driven show, so we'll be taking questions throughout from the live audience via our chat. I'm going to briefly introduce both uh, Rich and Gary, and then we'll get underway. Uh, professor Richard Doyle, a.k.a. Mobius, is a professor at Penn State University, University where he's taught since 1994. And he has uh, been the author of several books, including Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere. Uh, he's uh, also been a host for us with uh, Radio Free Vallis and Exploring the Soul of Nature, two different shows that we did on this online format. So we're grateful to Rich uh, to come for him coming back again with us. And we also have Gary Weber as our host, who has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He's also authored several books, including Happiness Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening. And I'd also like to announce that both uh, Rich and Gary have a new book out, and it's called Into the Stillness, Dialogues on Awakening Beyond Thought. I'm going to put the link to where you can get it from uh, Non-Duality Press, and they have an online link here, and perhaps uh, Rich and Gary can talk a little bit more about it later on, about the book, based on, on their dialogues. So let me put that in the chat, and I'm going to turn it over to Rich and Gary. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for sharing the link. Um, just a little bit about the book. Uh, it emerged out of nowhere, just like uh, the dialogues that Gary and I have been doing on video. And uh, with uh, the suggestion of uh, Suzanne Winters, we transcribed a lot of the videos and compiled them into a sequence and did very light editing because we wanted to preserve and capture the sort of spirit of the spontaneity that came out of there. So it was only when there was a kind of need for clarification that we edited it. And the result is really fun to work with because, uh, you know, as I edited through it, it was really fun because you can just open it anywhere. It's like a, it's a book for a bibliomancy. It's, it's designed to be the kind of thing you just leave around your apartment or your house and you just open it. And, there's like exchanges. And of course, neither Gary and I really remember or really were around for what emerged out of the, these exchanges. I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it's really not. And it was kind of amazing to pick up the book and look and see what these guys said, actually. Um, and it's certainly better than anything that we could come up with either on our own or even like deliberating together. Um, so I really look forward to seeing what people make of the book. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, to work with. And I think it's going to be useful for people because it emphasizes this um, strangely little explored part of the path, which is dialogue, right? That we hope to foster on this uh, webinar, which is this idea that the word dialogue comes with this idea of speaking through. It's not really one person speaking to another. Is two people opening themselves enough, two or more people opening themselves enough that the discourse just starts to flow through them. And that's really what happens in these webinars, in my experience. And it's what happened with Gary and I in our dialogues. Do you have something you want to add about the book? Or Yeah, I think, I think it was uh, the idea that this is a spiritual practice that I hadn't seen work successfully before. There are a lot of famous people who have been interviewed by other people, like Christian Murphy and uh, with David Bohm, and there was really not a sense of dialogue there. I mean, it was a questioner and somebody answering the questions, but there was no any concept of really working together to work out something you're both participating in. And what was so fascinating about this, as Rich uh, hinted at, was that we didn't know what we knew, and once we started talking together about something, then what emerged was something more than either one of us didn't know we knew and we never had seen before. And I lived with Rich and Suzanne, going back and reading through this thing, even though we had actually made it, uh, it was astonishing to see what we had said. We had no idea what we had said. It just came out as the reading was like, 
wow, this is really good. Not with any pride of authorship, but uh, just amazement at what had manifested completely spontaneously, serendipitously, uh, just opening up into whatever's going to manifest through either one of us and to see what the uh, combined result was. It was a fascinating process. So uh, if you have questions, we can start with those. I, I have a couple keywords that keep popping into my head that might, you know, resonate with what people are thinking about or not, which is fine. Well, I mean, uh, you can, if you want to start with those, I have a couple questions. It's up to you. I'll just put the keywords out there and I'll just say cool. a few words about those keywords and then we'll go with the questions. Great. The keywords are simplicity, which is that we're very tempted. I've, I've observed this in myself over the years in transforming this work into something very complicated. We think it's very complicated. And whenever it gets complicated, we need to just use as a heuristic, you know, as a little guideline, you know, who wants it to be difficult? Who wants it to be complicated? Who wants it, you know, to have to happen at some other time? Because it truly is profoundly simple. And part of the simplicity, this is the second part of the keywords, is part of the simplicity is that it's inside out. It comes from inside you outward. We can't look to something else in the world to solve it for us. The world exists as a feedback for us as we're doing this work from the inside out. But it's just us. It's you to do it. And so those two uh, ideas, simplicity, simplicity, and from the inside out are just something I wanted to make sure that I shared with people because I found them to be very useful for myself. I don't know if you have something you want to add to that or. Well, I, I, yeah. would, I would add a Ramon Maharshi quote that uh, the successful few are their success to their perseverance. So while this is very simple, uh, it is amazingly difficult for some people to just persevere and believe, as Rich said, it can be just as easy as just asking, where am I over and over again? in many different situations and seeing what unfolds. People just cannot believe it's that simple, that easy. It just requires a lot of dogged persistence. So questions. All right. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Matthew. I've noticed that although I practice a good amount, I spend a lot of time entertaining myself with things like Netflix and hobbies, it's, and hobbies, etc. This seems to keep my inquiry practice from pervading my experience throughout the day. If I want to awaken, should I be trying to give up these things and discipline my life more? Kind of like a very mild version of the renunciation talked about in the Buddhist path. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I, I work with people who do five hours of Facebook a day and also sometimes five hours of YouTube in addition to that. So yes, and you, to the point, uh, which was kind of touching on, ask yourself, what is it that isn't interested in doing, it doesn't want to do self-inquiry? There's something there that is trying to substitute Netflix or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, Instagram, for doing the self-inquiry. The self-inquiry doesn't require 16 hours a day of constant repetition. It really is just the inquiry in the course of the day, but there's something there that doesn't want this to go forward. Something that wants to be distracted, something that wants to substitute something, anything, just try to slow down the self inquiry process. So, yes, as much as you can, don't try to go cold turkey because you probably won't be able to do it, but try to work it down. I mean, cut it in half and cut it in half again and see if that works for you and see what happens with that extra time you have now. Do self inquiry or physical practice or uh, letting go practice. You know, there are lots of things you can do to keep this thing active, but you need to keep it. Give it some space. And Matthew, when you're when you're cutting it down, or even when you're just wondering about it as you are right now, it's a fantastic opportunity to to cultivate that sense of feeling. Like, what does that essentially that craving feel like? Like clearly you're observing yourself going to Netflix or doing other entertainment rather than engaging in self-inquiry. And that provides you with that moment, a kind of window to say, hey, what is that feeling like? What is it that it thinks it's going to feel like? Right. You know, I, I've noticed that, you know, when narrative mind comes up, it's there's some kind of promise that some sort of 
payoff is going to feel better than whatever it is that I'm experiencing. And when you just kind of pause on that, the more you can kind of cut down and slow down on the very moment that the craving arrives, then you get better and better at feeling the distinction between that actually very bad feeling that is the craving and the sort of cognitive promise, the promise like, oh, this is going to feel good. And it never does. It's really just trying to make the craving go away. So combined with the cutting down, you get this opportunity to see where and when these cravings are coming in. And that allows you to work directly on those attachments, which is, you know, gold. Because otherwise you don't know where they are. I realize too, Matthew, that it's important to kind of recognize that this ego eye is not your friend in this. Ego eye is really an adversary. It's a very clever, cunning, wily adversary. It will use eventually every trick it can possibly find to try to derail this process. Just when you think there are no more tricks to be had, it will come up with something else to try to deflect you. This is terrible. It's dangerous. You're going to go crazy. It's really schizophrenia. It's this, it's that, it's that. Just keep watching the stories that the ego I manifest to try to stop this process. And looking at Netflix or social media is one way to do it as well. Just anything to deflect you from doing self-inquiry. There's a, there's a discussion in the chat about being present and being catching the all even in the small things. Um, meaning, I guess, moments like watching Netflix, is it possible to remain in that awareness in those moments is kind of what's being well, asked in the chat. And there are our university researchers uh, who do uh, use movies as ways to try to interrogate the egoic structure, try to see what the baseline is for your default mode network by showing you movies. NYU is very famous for this. And yes, you can tease those out. You can watch yourself even in the midst of a movie Every time you're watching, you can feel your energy moving around. You can feel the mind go out towards a certain uh, event. Just as you're just saying, be, be conscious of that and see the ego running out and trying to grab hold of the stimulus and make something out of it. If you can, then pull that back if you're really present for it and just come back into where you were. You can be there in stillness and presence watching the movie and use that as a practice for you. Let it try to pull you out. And see yourself running out into these stimuli and say, oh, pull yourself back again into what is it that has this need for the stimulus? What is out there moving into that stimulus? And come back into stillness. Who's watching the movie of themselves watching the movie, basically. Um, but I think probably the reason why Gary and I both said to Matthew, yes, is because he's wondering. And if you're wondering that you have an inkling that you're entertaining in order to distract yourself from the stillness, then probably you are. But it's possible to abide in the stillness, it seems, through almost anything. Um, but if you want to become practiced in being in the stillness and you're using, you know, streaming media or social media to distract you from it, then that's probably very much getting in the way of it. And it's also tell you, Matthew, to trust those inklings is what Richard yeah. was really touching on. This is your deepest intuition, recognizing what the situation is and coming up with a little bit of a, hey, are you sure this is? And those little feelings that come out of your deep down here as opposed to up here are probably very close to the truth. I had a couple of them I was working with people today where they, they actually had the solution. And they just, they had a long, long blah, 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 email. And at the end, they said, I don't feel, it kind of feels like this and kind of feels like that. Well, that's exactly what it was. That was actually the solution, like we're just talking about here. They had this faint feeling, this faint uh, intuition that, in fact, it was a problem here. And maybe it was this thing. And trust that. Just to try it and trust it and see if, in fact, it is correct that you are wasting time on social media or whatever it is. Just trust your own intuition. It will be the guy that's going to have to carry you through this thing. Nobody will know as well as you do what's going on inside of you. So you can develop the feel for that, that intuition, and learn to trust that. 
it, that'll carry you all the way through. You can work on this DIY. And uh, at the same moment, if some part of you comes out and says, well, if it's real enlightenment, then I can be enlightened while I'm watching Netflix. Feel that too, right? You know, which has, you know, who has this abstract concept of enlightenment and how it is and so forth and how, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. It's not that you can't. It's just that what is that aspect of self that really is trying to get you to avoid doing anything about the predicament and just keep you fed with this stream of media. You can feel the difference. Matthew uh, is thanking you both for your continued guidance and he says, for me, Rich is right. I think there's something in me that knows I need to cut down on this desire to entertain myself. I think I needed some kind of validation of this urge from them. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Matthew, for the question. Thanks, Matthew. Um, and also with the great chat that everybody's having now about it. Uh, I'm going to go on to a question from Lindsay. And she asks, the idea that your person would already be doing what you're, what you're doing and going to do has been helpful when asking who. Like taking responsibility off my person and into the hands of oneness, while at the same time remaining an observer. Can you speak to the separation that is not separation? Um, I think I followed the question. Uh, the first thing is, that yes it feels very very good to release this very vague sense of ownership over our actions that we're absolutely certain of and yet is totally vague um, that comes from the feeling of being separate and being the author of our existence rather than being involved uh, in a dance with oneness being a dance of the oneness that when we can really release the responsibility whether we conceptually think we have free will or don't have free will if we can surrender we can even a little you can feel how all that burden that you were holding on to of being the author of your own existence really slides off of you and you can really feel like it often, for some reason, I, I often, you know, think of my shoulders when I think about that, that it just kind of releases from there. Um, but I think, as Lindsay is pointing out, nonetheless, one keeps on operating according to other people as if you were involved in this uh, separate world of being rich or being Gary and so forth. Um, and that's just... Uh, very strange that uh, e even though you can feel the increasing opening into the oneness and that um, no matter how much you get the impression that every now and then you are somehow a separate individual within this oneness, there's always some cosmic wink that reminds you some amazing synchronicity or just stray connection between things that has no business being there that reminds you that this separation is only apparent. It's only the way in which the world appears. It's not the actual way the world is. So uh, just as the world is not actually red or green or any of those colors, it's just the way in which our uh, senses perceive the world and that increasingly separation appears just as one of those qualities in the world that's not really there. So I don't know if that like long response really responded to the question, but that's where it took me. Something you might try, Lindsay, if you've got a very busy life now, I understand, is to uh, try to guess at the beginning of your day what's going to happen that day. Uh, try to imagine <laughs> what, might, what might happen that day as you start out the day. And, and see if, in fact, that's what happens during the day. Or if, in fact, your day turns out to be totally, completely different than what you imagined it might be. And if you do this as a daily practice and begin to see that, in fact, not just philosophically, but actually, 
You have no idea what's going on. Not just you, nobody does. And you begin to recognize you have no control, not even the slightest touch of control, because you can't predict a single thing in the course of your day. You think you can, but if you just watch it carefully, you have no clue what's going on. And if you eat that and really get into it, then the separation disappears because you recognize that you are being danced. I mean, you are being moved. This is all a play. It's completely out of your control, not philosophically, but you can see you can't predict any of it. We know this thing about you don't think up what you say. If you watch your thoughts, you don't think up what you think. If you watch your actions, they're going on automatically. If you try to predict what's going to happen in the course of your day, you can't do any of it. You can't predict any of it. So after a while, you just say, well, I just surrender. I just accept the fact that I cannot be in control. I see I am not in control. So I'll just let go because there's no point in arguing with it. I can't control it anyway. She uh, responds, Lindsay said, I think I am coming from that sense of control, so thanks, but no thanks, LOL. <laughs> um, and then she's, uh, yeah, wrote, wrote back, uh, then there is a sense of bhakti. So, uh, that's another yeah, if you want to talk about bhakti, that's a whole different different discussion. I don't know if we, we haven't done bhakti, I don't believe, in this series yet. Okay. Yeah. We did a little. A little bit. Yeah, yeah but, but the, the bhakti is really the idea of devotional practice in which you uh, surrender to some other higher power. It's kind of what this backs into bhakti we just talked about. And if you see that, in fact, you can't predict anything in your day, then the natural outcome is surrender. That's, you know, the bhakti thing is, can you surrender to some higher power? Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of bhakti in the East as well as in the West is that this devotional thing turns into, I will become devoted to you if I get a new car. If I get a better partner, if my marriage improves, I make more money, if my life gets better, if my cancer gets healed. Then I will love you, God, whatever it is, whatever iconic figure you, you've chosen. That's what it tends to be for almost everybody. There is the other one, though, uh, the continuation of this, which is that you become immersed in and absorbed by the object of your devotion. You don't become separate from it. You are you, are you here and it out there. Mother Teresa went through this. She was really bringing souls to Christ. And she really like that distance. She was here, Christ was there, she was bringing souls to him, it was really an act of love for her. However, she had a non-dual experience that lasted for the rest of her life, like 20 years. This was very upsetting to her because she really wanted to have the separation from Christ because she wanted to feel that love from Christ. And once she got the non-dual experience, then she was, she was God, she was Christ consciousness. And that was not what she had on her Christmas list. This was really a, a, you know, something she couldn't deal with, and she had nobody around her to support her in this thing. So she wrote a bunch of uh, letters over the course of decades called uh, Come Be My Guide, which is available everywhere, to just talk about this process of, as a bhakti, as a bhakta, uh, what happens to you as you become absorbed into the thing. Rich and I have talked about this, where you can... Kind of feel your object of devotion and see if you can move it into you or move yourself into it and let go so completely that you're not distinguishable from that energy. You feel the energy of the bhakti object and you move into it or have it move into you and see if you can in fact let go and disappear into that. That's true non-dual bhakti. Where you really become not separate from the one what you were talking about is to be not separate from this idea that you can control your life. It pushes you into bhakti as well because you can't control your life. You can see that. You watch your And in the bhakti relation, you can say, where is the control? Right? You can't find it. You can experience that immersion, but it's a kind of experience of ubiquity. It's not something is over here and something is over here. There's just this sense of ubiquity. So if there's ubiquity, there's no place for the control to reside. So that's another way in. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Lindsay, uh, for your question. 
And um, <clears throat> I'm going to go to a question from Corey. Corey asks, uh, Romana Maharishi was reported to have stressed that there is no objective world. It exists only as a thought that is created by the mind, which is also a thought. He also pressed on this, that there is a world that there is a world that there exists for others, even though one may be in a deep, dreamless sleep. For me, the inquiry continues, and the universe appears more and more like a dream. A dream and waking state seems the same. So many strange coincidences and no way to find something real. This puzzles me, and I'm curious to hear what arises here on this topic. What was the last part? The last line? Uh, this puzzles me, and I'm curious to hear what arises here on this topic. Well, I, I, I kind of knew this was going to come up, and uh, a book that I would recommend if, if it has any resonance is a book called uh, My View of the World by a uh, great physicist of uh, the 20th century, Erwin Schrodinger. And Schrodinger, of course, modeling physics, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, inventor of the idea of the genetic code, in fact, in the 1940s. Uh, and he has a very lucid exposition uh, of the non-existence of the objective world. And it's very difficult, uh, I agree with Corey, to grow, having grown up in a Western, uh, the Western world where the idea of an external world is just taken for granted. Um, but it seems to me what happens on this path is that more and more we experience that everything that we're responding to is in fact a thought. <laughs> Everything that we're responding to is, in fact, mediated through our nervous system. And that what we hypothesize as the external world is itself a thought. And it seems to me the strangeness or the puzzle comes from the false common sense view that there has to be an external world that is real instead of what Corey can do is turn around and look and see who is observing the commonality of the dream experience and of the waking life experience. And that, in my experience, is what is real. That which is observing all of this coming into being and passing away is solid and, and eternal and unchanging. And one of the benefits of the sort of puzzle that you're experiencing is it can make you look for what is unchanging and what is unchanging is not the external objective so-called material world, but the observer of that world. And the more you look and see who's puzzled, the more the brain and, and, and the self get aligned with what is unchanging. And then it, it doesn't appear to be disturbing at all. It feels to be grounding and uh, um, solidifying. I know Gary would have plenty to say about this. Yeah, the cognitive neuroscience is really useful in this, Corey. Um, you've heard from me many times. I know in the default mode network and this thing of, with both with magic mushrooms and also with ayahuasca and with meditation, we found what parts of the default mode network create this belief that we are separate from other things and that we are something that passes through time from a past to a future. And we know the parts of the circuit that create those, those beliefs, those sensations. I mean, the brain just creates the sensation of you being separate from the chair. Is it a sensation? The brain creates it. Because of you passing, having a past and a future, the brain creates that. We know the circuit that creates it. We know how psychedelics can shut it down. We know how meditation can shut it down. and give you the other experience. So that's an indication that, in fact, this world as seen is not real. I mean, it's just constructed by the brain. We have 35% of our total brain capacity dedicated to visual processing. That's a huge amount. So it's not just taking the picture and looking at the picture. It has an enormous amount of processing power back here to make the world look like something we can operate in. I mean, it is a constructed world. There are five different, four different levels of the optical cortex, the cortex back here, that actually do this processing. This making up of this world to make it look real. And you can, as you go forward, see directly that it is unreal you know, in a way that it doesn't have, the sub, isn't substantive. You can see that it's kind of filmy, it doesn't have edges, it isn't discrete. You can feel the energy that's in the world 
but it isn't really defined precisely as the world. It is just an approximation. We see the world also on a time lag. We don't, we never see the world exactly as it is. It's always time lag. The brain can't process it instantaneously. So we have that. We have this optical pro civil processor back here. We have this creation of self and other and self through time. So I wish you could look at this thing, but it is absolutely not a real world as far as what we're just saying, an unchanging thing, a true, a true reality. It's not what it is. It, a, it changes, but B, it is a completely constructed reality. If we have a dog in the room, the dog sees a different world. If we have a fly in the room, the fly sees a different world. Not just because they're obscured, that their world is just as real to them as our world is to us, or unreal, that they just see what their processors can grasp. So they each have their own different constructed worlds. Rich has a different world than I do, than you do, because your sensory apparatus is different than mine. Your processor is different than mine. You see and live in a different world than I do. So we have different worlds, not just philosophically, but actually we live in different worlds. I know you hear better than I do, you see better than I do, so you definitely have a different world than I do. But there is something behind all that that is real. Uh, oh, there's, there's, there is the great vast oneness, which is the unchanging part. And that's the only place, you know, non-duality has the only answer to that question. And then, okay, if this is all changing, if it's all we just talked about, unreal, then is there anything that is not changing? Is there something that is the witness upon which all of this manifests, all of this change and changing that occurs, is there something there that is not changing, that has been there exactly the same way when you were a three-year-old as it is now, as it will be in 20 years from now? So is there something, just keep looking for something that isn't changing and see if you can find it and feel it. And when you look for that, because this, you're getting the inkling that this whole external world isn't real, it won't do to just look out there for it, right? Not even, you know, not even Mount Everest is real in that regard. But if you turn around and look and see who's looking at Everest or who's looking at the creek or who's looking at the tree, then you start to get an inkling of this eternal oneness that is behind all of this coming into being and going out of being. And so I just emphasize that because it can be, I, I, I myself at once upon a time, I began to get inklings about how everything was unreal, but it just freaked me out because I didn't ever think to look back and see who was noticing that it was unreal. And if you look back at the subject, if you look back at the observer, then the kind of discord of the fact that the world is unreal is rewarded with the comfort of the eternal aspect of the observer. That makes sense. Yeah, the problem we have is that there is no institutional religious or philosophical support for this idea that the world is not real. I mean, they want to believe you believe that that car is real, that house is real, this partner is real, this job is real, the money is real. But in fact, if you watch carefully, you can see it's all concepts. It's managed concepts which they have a vested interest in supporting. And so you need to take it upon yourself to directly experience this unchanging witnessing that is completely different from and discreet from all the stuff that's in, that flows through consciousness. Right. And for, so, for example, what could be more real, apparently, than, say, a new car? You, and you, you do all the research. You somehow come up with the loan or the money. You go. You do the negotiation. You get ripped off. You get the car, you drive it off a lot. What happens to the car the moment it, it, it depreciates by 20%? It's, it's proof that it's not real. It's just changed in status just by leaving the driveway of the lot. And you experience that because the observer is eternal and says, ooh, that just changed, but I, I didn't. Well, I mean, even <laughs> in the concept of the new car. Yes. I want the car, I want the car, I want the car, I want the car, I want this car, this value, I want this Okay, car. all right, Gary. You get the car, and you drive to the parking lot, you don't want to price it down. Yeah. But then you find very quickly, within, you know, a couple of days, it's like, no, Yeah, it's, it's like, like, it's fine. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, just, it's, it's a, a car. It's a fantastic car. You can see it change in your own consciousness. How much it changes. And the car also physically is changing. 
But in what we are conscious of, it the idea of the car. You can yeah. watch the idea of your car change very quickly and very dramatically. And how you regard that is a very changeable quantity. Is there something there that's not changing on the value in your mind that that car changes? So if we look to the world to provide us with that sense of reality, we're going to be frustrated. But if we look to the looker, then we can find it. I just want to quickly give a comment that Lindsay just made in the chat. But yes, but in 30 years, the car appreciates as a classic. <laughs> um, and then uh, Corey actually uh, replied, um, yes, now this self, the ultimate viewer, Buddha refuted it outright, saying this is a concept. Is this unchanging, totally empty, or is that just a concept too? Yes. No, I mean, Corey, I, I would just look at it. This is a well-known <laughs> Bhagavad Gita verse. Saman Sarveshu, Bhutashu, Tishtam, Tam Parameshwaram, Vinishantam, Pasyati, sa pasyati. You know, within all of us is this consciousness. And we have the ability to see things that are changing and things that are not changing. You can just look directly. Forget about what Buddha said. Just take your own experience and see what in your life is changing and what in your life isn't changing. If you can't find something that isn't changing, then Bhagavad Gita is a lie. And your experience has no value. Just try and see if you can find something that doesn't change throughout the course of your day, even month, week, but just even throughout the course of your day, something doesn't change because your experience is continuously changing every day. And everything you touch and see changes. Consciousness changes. Your apprehension of things changes. Your, your belief about things changes. There's something that doesn't change. And even the example of the car becoming a classic makes the point, right? It becomes a classic precisely because everything is changing. It too changes. Thank you. That uh, Corey says, amazing. Thank you, everyone. In the chat, and Gary and Rich for that dialogue, that was not real. And then, ha, ha, ha. Great. Thank you, Corey. And uh, thank you, yes, for everybody in the chat, too, adding and uh, discussing what's being discussed. It's great. Um, I have a bit of a change of pace from Esteban, who asks, what, if any, films have you found helpful in breaking down self-referential internal narrative? Which films? Well, I watched The Big Lebowski last week with my son uh, having not seen it since before I started this practice. I saw it when it came out and then I saw it last week. And if you, you watch the big Lebowski, uh, you know, I always remembered the final lines, you know, the dude abides because, and he's just observing like the most incredibly ridiculous things pop up, come into being, go out of being. Nothing makes any sense. There's no possible way of narrating what is occurring to this character. Um, Every time the John Goodman character attempts to create a story out of what is occurring, more suffering ensues. So in that sense, on a kind of content level, you can observe that it's possible to see that the only way this character really was able to, as it were, abide what occurred to them was by the silencing of uh, more or less self-referential thought. Of course, he did it with bowling and white Russians. Uh, but the, the point remains, I think, from the point of view of the viewer watching the film is that the only sense that can be made of this film is that it makes no sense. And whenever any sense is attempted to be made in the film, suffering occurs. Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, movies around using the theme of moving pretty much towards non-duality, said in many different ways. Uh, there was like the Matrix, or a lot of things like the Matrix that have been put out over the course of the last several years to come very close to that whole theme. In fact, this is all a dream, it's all out of our control. We're just you know, sock puppets basically in some giant uh, program. Uh, and there's lots of derivatives on that. And if you were to write, one something that changed my consciousness was watching a film of Ramana Maharshi. Uh, we do have real live videos, you can go to YouTube and go to Ramana Maharshi. And you can get some live videos from the 30s and 40s 
And just to watch him, there's something really different about the guy. Just to watch him walk around, he's very hobbled, his hips in bad shape, he has to use a cane. But there's something totally different about him. You couldn't mistake him for the people around him. He's clearly very different than what they are. And not because I knew, I knew who he was, because you could pick him out of 10,000 people. He really was a very different personification. And so to me, that's what really pulled me into, I'd like to have the experience he's had. And so I set about trying to do that. And I did everything I could find in his teachings. So to me, that was a very definitive and important pointer that here's a guy who lived while I've been alive. We have videos of it. He was on BBC. He was on Life Magazine. Margaret Bork White interviewed him. Henry Carter wrote songs with the last pictures of him. I mean, it's a, a real person, alive while we've been alive, and he was very different. And so to me, that was the most interesting and insightful and, and uh, whatever, enervating, pushing me towards there's something I think I can get my hands on. We'll try to get my hands on. So that to me was a very powerful movie. It's free, it's easy to get on YouTube. You said it's on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Free. Great. Thank you uh, for those answers. And, and uh, people in the chat are throwing in some suggestions as well for movies. So keep the questions coming in the chat, everybody. They're great. Um, I'm going to keep keep going if you guys are good with that. Uh, yes, please. Rich and Gary. Okay, cool. Um, Mark asks if you guys have any feedback on dealing with conflict. Specifically, conflict with loved ones where it's tough to get away from and it's hard to be still. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, Mark, one thing that I've found is, is it's really about you in the conflict, it's not about them. And your job isn't to fix them in the conflict. My experience is all I can do is work on myself and my reactions and my either being present or not being present. And I found over long term relationships, several many long term relationships, that if I get myself uh, as clear and as still and as present as I can possibly do it, that the relationship changes. And the, the other person looks appears to change, but the relationship clearly changes. But forget about fixing them, work on yourself, get yourself clear, sorted out. You can hardly bring peace to the world. If you're confused and unhappy and unsettled and angry and hostile inside, only by being peaceful yourself and still yourself and present yourself can you hope to have the other person be part of your relationship and operate in the same way. Yeah, it's it's great practice, as Gary and I have both spoken about in the past, is that it go it it, it goads one to work on oneself, right? That the moment we think that we're at peace or we've arrived at some new threshold or some such that if we're involved in the pedestrian everyday conflict, then the conflict point is a pointer. It's a finger pointing at ourselves to work on ourselves, to do self inquiry, to meditate, to look and see what it is that is, uh, that is going out of ourselves to respond and attempt to fix in this way that Gary has said. And so um, I think it's really one of the most powerful parts of practice is, you know, more or less being forced to figure out how to live in these kinds of relationships. When, as Gary said, we live in different worlds. We all live in different worlds. So we have to live in our own worlds together. And the practice of doing that is, uh, there leads only one way, which is to work on ourselves. It can also be helpful. We've got a video on this as well about seeing your, wife and children or close relatives, whatever it is, co-worker, I mean, see them as Zen teachers, see them as Zen masters. And what they're doing is showing to you where you need to work on yourself. Yeah. Don't, you're not going to fix the Zen master. Just take them and say, especially kids, if you have kids, they are a great mirror. They really, there's no BS with them at some level that they know what the game is. They know how to push your buttons. A long-term partner the same way. They know exactly how to push your buttons. So, Recognize them, they are a great teacher. Don't push them away. They are an important way of showing you what you need to work on. 
Krishna already said you only see yourself through relationship. You can't find yourself in a vacuum. You need to work on something and they'll show it to you. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for, for that question, Mark. If you have any uh, reply or any kind of response, you can put it in the chat. And um, I'm going to keep going with questions here. One from Billy, and he asks, Gary, would you say you've been in complete stillness since your self-referential thought just fell away, or does it still come up and you just get better at not getting involved? I wouldn't say I get better at not getting involved. Uh, clearly, the brain works this thing out. Uh, I've, I've said many times in different interviews that there's no end point of enlightenment. There's no point at which you're done. It's all over. You get an Olympic gold medal and you get to go home. Uh, you, this has to be sorted out over time. It keeps going deeper and deeper. And you keep getting challenges like we just talked about that uh, show you places that need more work. We've got 50 trillion synaptic interconnections. Only a tiny fraction of those, say you know, a few percent, are involved in this. It's still a trillion. That's a lot of synaptic interconnections to work on and a lot of complex neural networks that need to be straightened out and repatterned and torn down and reorganized. That's a long process. So anybody that thinks you know, there's a, a light bulb or a light switch that turns on and off and, okay, there you're done now, uh, isn't being realistic with themselves. They declare themselves, I'm awakened, I'm enlightened, I'm done. They're in for a surprise because soon afterwards they'll find out, well, I'm supposed to be enlightened and I'm being like a complete jerk. So, you know, that, that goes on, goes on, goes on. So, I mean, don't kid yourself you're going to come to a point and be done. I, I don't, I'm not perfect, believe me, and I'm not done. And I've been working now for you know, 16, 17 years. Since the page turned and my thoughts stopped. Still, the work goes on and goes on and goes on. You can feel it deepening, getting more still, getting more quiet. It just feels more locked down. But just when you think, oh, okay, something comes up. It seems to be the universe says, okay, you've got this little figure, this level figured out. But how about this level of this particular stimulus or attraction or desire or pain or anguish? Or how about this level? You keep working on those increasing levels. You just keep getting more and more refined. If you look on this as being, you know, the universe evolving, you are the part of the universe, then it makes sense the universe would want to keep evolving. And it doesn't keep evolving if you keep getting level three problems. You need to have a level four problem, a level five problem, a level six problem to keep you evolving. So there's no, there's no dead end point you can walk away and say, I'm done. Not in my experience, and not in some other people's experience as well. Yeah, it's really actually fun to watch as the universe like tries to pile it on. You know, like it, it'll it'll find what it thinks a a hot button is for you, and then you know, try this, try this, try this, try this, try this, and you can just sort of observe it, and then it'll find something. It'll it'll find something that will make the whole thing. And you go, ah, got you. Right. So then you have to work that then again, it's a wonderful experience. I mean, it, there's pain associated with it, but it's a wonderful experience of saying, oh, like it's almost. Oh, goody. Here's one to work on. Right. You know, but it's almost you really can feel like and Gary told me about this early on. And I like to be honest, couldn't quite believe it. But it's just like she raises the ante. The cosmos just keeps like. You're saying, oh, okay, you can deal with this. How about this and this and this? And it gets really baroque and uh, complicated. She's really like doing all kinds of gymnastics as a universe to just like make you go to the next level. It's quite something really to observe. Yeah, two clarifications I also offer it. I've been very public about this is this is a physiological thing as well. I mean, we think we know what two centers basically monitor and control this shutdown in this, this default mode network. We know where they are, we know what names they are, we know what jobs they do, and it looks like they're uh, not the first ones on the brain's allocation of energy uh, scenario. What that means, in my experience, is that if I get really tired, my blood sugar gets very low, I'm having glycemic, then in fact the brain has to make a decision. It can either support fight and flight, or it can support 
having no thoughts. And not surprisingly, the brain says, no, we'll go for fight and flight because the lion's coming. We need to do something here. So you're going to have a few thoughts here. So that's the logical thing for the brain to do. It makes sense evolutionarily what happened and happens for me not very often, but it does happen. If my blood sugar is very low, I get very tired thoughts and pick up. I'd also point out there's a good video on this called Three Different Types of Thoughts. And it gets into this discussion about this self-referential narrative, which is the really highly problematic stuff that we work on. We call it SRIN and blah, blah. That can be cut down dramatically. And even if it doesn't come to zero, if it at least gets de-energized, where you change the stickiness of the thoughts to each other, if you cut down their number, your life gets better. So don't think that nothing happened and then it's going to be stopped completely or I haven't made it. You can, you'll progress as you go down that path, you'll feel better and better and better as the thoughts get less energy, less activated, less sticky, less numerous. Uh, it keeps improving and improving and improving. But you also have another kind of thought, which is how do I get to the interstate? How do I plan something? How do I problem solve? Those are a different kind of thoughts. You can almost surgically remove the problematic ones and leave the other ones. You aren't you know, prescribed from doing thinking about thoughts, using thoughts to solve a, a complicated problem, or learn a language, or read a book, or whatever it is. Those aren't problematic. They don't hurt you. They don't pull you in. You aren't caused anxiety by them. The other ones we can get rid of or cut them down a lot. This one's, you want to keep these, keep these guys. Indeed, uh, it's good fun to watch as the self-referential internal narrative gets out of the way. So example, I work a lot on my bicycles and I'm kind of mechanically challenged and I have an idea of myself being mechanically challenged. And there was a particular mechanical issue that came up last night and I watched as thoughts started to come in about like how stupid I was and poorly equipped I was to do this. And why was I always getting myself? And, said, and I just, you know, did self inquiry on it, let it alone, left it alone till the next day, walked out this morning without thinking about it. And the, the planning thoughts, the problem solving thoughts had solved it. And I wasn't even aware that I was doing it. Walked over to the bicycle didn't even think about a sequence, just put parts into a configuration, pop, boom, fixed, right? So it was really funny example of what Gary is talking about there is that once upon a time, that sort of self-loathing narrative mind aspect would have just like taken up all the bandwidth and I never would have gotten to solve it. I would have like, you know, just left it for months, probably. <laughs> probably what I would have done. It would have been worse and would rust it. I wouldn't be able to find all the parts. And instead, I just like saw part of me that uh, that I think Corey was talking about earlier, or or and Matthew as well saw that something was coming up. I did self inquiry on what was coming up. Let it alone. It's like I can care less. It doesn't need to be. You know, there I, I can let go of this. There's, I, it's not me, right? You know, I let go of it. The parallel processing unit up here clearly was working on it all night, trying out all the geometrical and mechanical configurations, not even sending word to the conscious mind that this could be done. I walk outside, <laughs> amazing. So to me, that's an inkling of just how much, as Gary was saying before, this self-referential internal narrative is not our friend. It's like, it's, it's throwing a wrench in the works, literally. And the more we let it go, the more we can see that there is this other aspect of thought that is actually we're quite capable of. There's no problem. It's more my idea of myself as being mechanically challenged that is the case rather than, in fact, being mechanically challenged. And when the idea gets out of the way, then the bike gets fixed. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great metaphor and a great story. Uh, that whole idea that we have, you know, we have this little tiny processor we talked about before the rider and the elephant. This little tiny processor, which is our conscious processor, can do seven plus or minus two data pieces at a time, solving one problem. Underneath that sits something that has 100 billion neurons, 50 trillion synaptic interconnections, massive high-speed neural data processor, data storage, uh, wonder of the universe. And so where do you think the problems get solved? They don't get solved up here. I mean, the, the bike 
couldn't get fixed up. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. And so what happens, there's some really good research on this one. We have tried to do complicated problems like, like fixing the bicycle. One, two, three, JKL, four, five, six problems to require some discontinuous uh, innovation to solve the problem. And you can watch the brain do this. The brain actually takes the problem back to this quadrant, shuts down a long-term communication, focuses on solving the problem. And it works on the problem, like Rich was saying, run around to all its work on this problem until the next Next morning, remember, it turns out this problem has been solved, and it comes over to this side, frequency changes, communication changes, and there's a center right here, and six to eight seconds before the rider up on top of the elephant knows the problem has been solved, the scientists say, hey, they've solved the problem. Six to eight seconds later, it goes up to the rider, and the rider announces, I have solved the problem. I have fixed the bicycle. When, in fact, the bicycle was fixed offline, and the rider was clueless about this thing. Thank God. Yeah, the rider literally was a bike rider, just right. observed that it was fixed. Right. It was like, oh my God, that just got fixed. <laughs> Without the rider. Yeah, no rider. That's an awesome example. That's really uh, helpful. Uh, and, and, and you, you can find that every day. What you can do is the problems you work on the course of the day, just let go of them. Yeah. And see what happens. Go, go through the night. And the brain is working frantically, frantically, busy on those things offline to try to solve them. And the next morning, if you do a morning sit, which I almost always do, you will see what Rich saw. Up comes the answers. Here's what you know Curly and Mo worked on last night. And here's a possible solution. What do you think about this thing? That's you know, there is a reporting thing that you can really train the brain to do so. First thing in the morning, it comes up with all the work that's been done the night before. It says, here are the things we've worked on. Here are the solutions we've developed. Now, you can really work with your brain this way and recognize this little guy up here doesn't do anything except take credit and pass around blame. The work is all done offline. So respect you've got that capability. You can give the problem to it, and it'll work on the problem. It'll fix the bike. That's very cool. Uh, I have a question that kind of follows up to that with something you just mentioned, Gary. This is a question from Corey asking, um, how important is morning stillness before starting the day? This is the main approach of Zen and many other stillness training schools. I think it's really important. Uh, if, you, if you can sit in the morning, uh, one, you've got kids, Corey. I had kids. And you can't really get time at night. You just can't get it if they're little kids. Even if they're teenagers, you can't get time at night, quiet time. So first thing in the morning to me was very important. I just blocked out the time. I was not an early riser. I just blocked out the time to do it. And what's happened for me was if I said, I set like 40 minutes for, once you get past 35 minutes, you have a chance of getting into something like a runner's high. So you kind of a sweetness that the brain gets as a kibble for sitting there and meditating first thing in the morning. And it does clear itself out. And I found that if you do that, then the whole course of the day is changed. Just for that 25, 35, 40 minutes in the morning, your entire day changes. It doesn't just stop when you stop meditating. Your entire day is biased in a whole different way than if you didn't do that sitting. So I find the first thing in the morning to be invaluable. Last thing at night is also very useful to clean up the day. First thing in the morning is really powerful. That's why I do it. I've done it for, for 40 years. And it and it seems to be powerful also because it does seem that first thing in the morning can be a moment when like a lot of thoughts come up because you're coming into waking consciousness and sort of the ego you know claims to have all these plans for the day it thinks it knows what's going to happen and so forth um, so getting in the habit of being still in the morning that sort of starts to fall away and you just get into that point of just observing what the day is doing. Instead of, as Gary was saying earlier in our conversation, planning out the day and then seeing that it's not that. Right. Do you, just a little side question for you both. Um, do you, if you drink coffee or, or tea, do you have that before you do your practice or do you try to do it with nothing? I do. I drink caffeine first. Okay. We, we got an interesting uh, feedback of one of our uh, dialogues. Uh, somebody who will remain nameless. Uh, accused us of being caffeine addicts because we're always seen drinking tea. We saw us drinking tea tonight. 
Uh, that, I drink tea first thing in the morning. I, I love my I love tea. I drink it all day long. I don't just do it in the morning. But I I find it's really part of my morning practice. And I drink green tea, so it's not highly caffeinated. But I but I do drink tea, and I find it to be an important part of the process. Now I will say though, uh, uh, Roland Griffiths, uh, who Rich, uh, of course, did a thing with last week for Huff, Huff Media. Uh, is the guy at Hopkins who runs the psilocybin and the magic mushroom program. He's run it for now probably uh, seven or eight years. And they've done great work on uh, magic mushrooms for pain, cancer pain mediation. Now they've moved over into meditation. Uh, here's the guy, the guy you would want to be the person to uh, work with the FDA on something like psilocybin. Uh, he's very careful, uh, conservative, well-spoken, uh, highly respected. He writes excellent papers. And he says the number one drug of the abuse in the United States is caffeine. And, and he and I went out and had, had one had breakfast and uh, not filled up one time. And uh, well, I had a cup of tea. We had a cup of tea, just green tea. And he, he was really uh, put off by just the amount of caffeine there was even in a cup of green tea. So there are people, you know, reasonable, think well or highly informed, clear thinking people who say caffeine is a major concern because it is widely abused. Whether it's Red Bull or it's Monster, whatever it is, I mean, there are people who are you know, grossly abusing caffeine now. And yes, if you can dial down your caffeine, dial it down. I try to work it down, see if you can get by with less. But I, I do, I will confess, I, I do have a cup of tea first thing in the morning. It's much more effective if you dial it down, down to I, in the past, I was a caffeine abuser, um, drinking enormous amounts of coffee all day when I was in graduate school. Uh, but I found less. I will say that one moment where it is beautiful to not caffeinate is then sometimes my brain will wake me up in the middle of the night and more or less direct me to meditate. And so then I just go and meditate for however long it is. And then go back to sleep. I don't. I don't drink caffeine before I do that, and there does not seem to be anything different about the meditative experience uh, without the caffeine because the brain has primed me, saying, "Okay, go, go sit. We want to get some offline time now that we can't get while you're asleep for whatever reason." So, but I, you know, I think uh, green tea during the day, a cup of coffee or two in the morning doesn't seem to be abusive to me. I think the point is everybody's a little different too, and to notice your own feedback loop. What, how does it affect you? You know, experiment with all the different uh, levels yourself from the inside out. Yeah, I would say that the, every person is different thing. My blood pressure was very low. And so from that perspective, the caffeine, this, this is this is rationalization or something. <laughs> it not, now is the fact that it, to get my blood pressure up to what normal for your blood pressure is, it probably takes me some caffeine to do that. But the more important thing is Rich was talking about this being awake in the middle of the night and being, you, you have you sit up in bed, you know you have to meditate. When the brain does that, the brain says, look, we didn't get our meditation time today, we're going to meditate. And you'll find yourself awake at 2 o'clock in the morning, sitting someplace. You don't know why you're there, you're just sitting there, and the brain's getting its time. And once it's time, it's going to find a way to get it. It will wake you up, and you'll find yourself sitting downstairs, meditating because the brain wants to get its time in this day. And it's fine too, because it doesn't subtract from your sleep actually. It's amazing. So when that happens, just go with it. That's great advice and good to know for those weird late night, early morning moments. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, I have a question from Katie and, um, and, and Corey, if there was anything you wanted to respond there, just of course feel free in the chat. But thank you for that question. Katie asks, concerning oneness or unchanging beyond reality, can we describe the emptiness of the form with another form? No. I would say no. I mean, if it really is an emptiness, I mean, one, one thing about trying to describe this. I mean, it's, it's ineffable, it's you know, transcendent, so you can only go so far with concepts and words and symbols. And so I would use, I've used words like 
it's a fullness that you can't imagine putting anything into or taking anything out that would improve it. I mean, it's, it's unimprovable, it's totally complete, and it really, it, there's, no, there's no place in it for a form. It really is emptiness uh, without a form in it. It really is complete, still vastness. And the problem is there's, there's, there's no one there to, to image a form. If you really get into the, uh, feel the awareness watching consciousness, the objects in consciousness, you turn back and look back at the watcher. You try to interrogate, find the watcher, feel your way into the watcher. If you keep doing that, eventually what will happen, or in the Bakke practice we talked earlier, what will eventually happen is this little tiny bump of an eye will start to dissolve. And you'll find that there is no coalescence in awareness that would be able to see an object or visualize an object manifested in the form. So there's just nothing here except witnessing. Mm. So there is no place for an object to form because there's no subject to form the object subject of the relationship so it just goes into there's nothing here even to begin looking as a subject so positing a form to verify this wouldn't make any sense there's nothing there to make the form visible apprehendable observing without an observer Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, I have another question here. Actually, Corey just followed up. How different is that fullness from lucid dreaming? There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of skepticism about lucid dreaming. There's a lot of scientific neurological skepticism about what, flirt, what lucid dreaming is, uh, what it means, if it's even really a state, if it's like half awake, half asleep. Um, I know it's much talked about in the, in the internet uh, about lucid dreaming, what it, what it means. Uh, there's not a clear readout of the neuroscience committee or community on what lucid dreaming is. So, I, whatever. Uh, I've experienced, I think, both, uh, whatever it is, and I'd say it's very different. Um, there's an inkling that, of similarity in the sense that uh, in lucid dreaming, you kind of become aware that you're aware in a dream. You know that you're a dreamer. But you don't take the next step and look and see what is the dreaming. And so there is something wonderful that's kind of between the two that Gary told me about that comes from, uh, I think comes from Robert Adams, might just be part of the jhana yoga tradition, which is to tell yourself before you go to sleep to uh, look back and see who the dreamer is just before you wake up, because there is that kind of moment before you open your eyes that is very good to prime your beginning of your day and saying, you know, who is dreaming? And there really is this kind of interval where it's like watching the garage door close or something. I don't know. You can sort of see the light underneath it. And the perception of the perceiver can occur there in the morning. And that that's something that is, is, I suppose, uh, on the continuum of lucid dreaming. But to me, the experiences I've had are very different. And experiences of lucid dreaming led me to try to figure out who the dreamer was, but they're di very different. Yeah, so, so something else I, I, I get a question a lot is, do you, are you awake all night? Are you aware all night long? And some people globally say, yes, they are aware all night long. Well, my problem is I can't remember what I said five minutes ago. Really, I have no ability to call that back. So to pause it then, I could say, well, yes, for nine hours last night, I was continuously aware and awake is, is, is ridiculous. I mean, it just doesn't, it isn't possible. There's a lot of study uh, been done on how long dreams last. We think they last for a long time. Actually, dreams are very, very short. Yeah. Time, time wise. So there's, there's just so much uh, about that dream state that uh, people haven't really looked at very carefully. But this idea of what I did all last night, we have no idea what you did all last night. And what you dream, how much of last night you took, you have no idea, unless you were actually wired up to a EEG or something. So um, yeah, you'll have a lot of experiences about dreams in general. Uh, there's a good, I heard a blog post on sleep. 
And there's much made about symbols in dreams. There's a lot of controversy about interpreting dreams, all the way from Freud all back to those Aboriginals. Uh, and the neuroscientists will tell you that, in fact, what the reason we sleep is a kind of dangerous thing evolutionarily. You, would, yeah. you wouldn't think you'd want to sleep because it's, you can get eaten while you sleep. But yet, all mammals sleep and uh, fish sleep. So you say, it's, it's why do we do that? Well, you do it because the, the spaces between the neurons actually open up at night. So you can actually get the CNS, the snow fluid, flowing through the brain to sweep away all the waste that would generate during the course of the day. If you don't sweep away that waste, then they believe you can push yourself into things eventually, like say, lamyloids, which leads you to, also, to uh, Alzheimer's. So you know the brain has to do that every night to clean this thing out. And we think we see, oh my God, this is a fantastic dream I had last night even about this is a this. And what seems to happen is you, what you're taking is you're taking out the garbage. It just so happens that everything is just thrown into the garbage bag and they all kind of come out together. And so you've got two or three things that would never be juxtaposed, arranged together, just juxtaposed because they happen to be in the same garbage bag. And we try to make some sense out of those. And people spend a lot of effort and time trying to Imagine what this dream means. Well, it may mean nothing more than those things happen just be coming out of the brain at the same time. And it also means that there is a self there that's going back and insisting on narrating there exactly. to be a meeting there. Right. So e e even even if there were some meaning in there, then it's through the lens of that writer again. So it's kind of even if it's not garbage in, it's garbage out. Because it's being interpreted by an ego that thinks that it's separate from everything and is located in space time, which it is not. And so it has a highly distorted view of anything. So even if there was some sort of uh, message or knowledge to be gleaned from dreams, probably not going to get it. Well, pass through somebody else's system. Yeah. yeah. That's a good good distinction there it's uh, the telling of the dream not the dream itself mm -hmm. so, um, I have a question from Jake thank you Katie for your question if you have anything you'd like to add of course just do so in the chat I have a question for Jake I think we have time for this one more here uh, I'm getting to the point where I trust what practice comes up such as what self-inquiry question arises this means that different questions might arise in the same day can I just continue to trust, or is this a cul-de-sac? Thanks. Is it, what's the last word? Oh, or is this a cul-de-sac? Hi, Jake. Um, yeah, yeah if the, the, big, the thing to worry about is if someone just starts self-inquiry. We talked earlier about the brain being, or the ego being a very cunning adversary. Uh, one of the delaying tactics is just to keep throwing cafeteria questions in continuously. Maybe five or six different uh, Something where our questions in the course of the same 10 minutes. Now that's just a that's a that's just a blocking tactic. If you're actually moving around and you're going through your day and you're saying, oh, I have a you know a piece of anger here, or I feel I'm worried and concerned about getting a job, or I'm worried and concerned about my salary, you can say who's worried about the salary, who's concerned about this thing, who's angry. You can move it around that way when you're making it situationally appropriate. And you're really tying it into exactly what's happening at the time, which can be really valuable because you are really walking into the experience. You're saying who's having this experience, this particular experience, and making something meaningful out of it. So if you're doing that, you've been at this a while, Jake. Uh, you can do that. You let it move around as it is useful and an ad hoc basis in the course of the day because you're way past the, the uh, being deluded by window shopping. So I encourage you to go ahead and make it ad hoc, make it. Uh, appropriate to the situation, and wherever it can get bite, use it. Yeah, it's amazing to watch how one's own intuition becomes this teacher and all these tactics become useful. And you know, you can feel when they're real tactics that have a bite, as Gary said, and when they're not. I mean, the, the problem is, as Gary was saying in the beginning, you're just treating it like a salad bar or something. And you're never settling on anything, but situational awareness, you know, is everything. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think we're 
kind of hit the end of our questions here, and uh, I did I did have an ongoing question from a couple of people in the chat, Rich, just asking more about your own personal story, if there was mm -hmm. time. I know you went into this the last session, I believe, but just, um, you know, just how you, you got to where you are in this journey. I don't know if there's anything that maybe relates to today that you'd like to to bring up. That's kind of a sure. large question. Yeah. Great. I mean, again, it's it's like the distinction between the dream and the telling of the dream, but nonetheless, I'll tell the dream. Um, you know, um, I was lucky enough to have some, uh, you know, extraordinary wake up calls in my life and the death of my brother and the death of my mother 10 years later. The death of my brother in, in 87, I just threw myself into work and so I was in that task network and didn't allow myself to suffer in the same way that I might have. My mother died again and, and died in 97. I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get up from that. I, I was just crushed by it. And I more or less involuntarily started meditating because it was like, I, I often compare it to like, if you watch a dog trying to find a, a comfortable place to sit down it'll circle and so forth. The only thing that felt okay was to just sit with my back against the wall straight up and to enter into silence. And so I almost kind of, the cosmos just started teaching me that I needed to meditate. From there, a physical practice emerged a little, again, I, I don't, I, there was no deliberation, but I started swimming uh, laps in a pool to physically get myself uh, into a place of reconstruction. That also led to uh, bicycle riding and so forth. So I was in this sitting practice and I had acquired a physical practice when the universe put uh, um, put me uh, into a situation where I went to Peru to drink ayahuasca. Again, the idea that I ever could have predicted this and how it transformed me is just, you know, ridiculous. In the experience of ayahuasca, I experienced the observation of my own thoughts and I experienced the utter kind of fecundity and and beauty of no thought. And but of course the dreamer in the dream, uh, you know, persisted in the sense that these remarkable experiences of being healed of lifelong severe asthma, um, for example, by a remarkable teacher Norman Pandora and ayahuasca, led to narrative that I had about my life and about ayahuasca and my story. So in some ways I became even more attached to my own story. And so there was a lot of volatility about the I trying to figure out what the heck had happened to it. And so uh, rather organically, the next phase was to, after continuing meditation, was to meet Gary and to start integrating self-inquiry into well who drank ayahuasca <laughs> who was it that was who was healed and that turning around which i had already started to do but that validation and intensification and disciplining of that turning around and looking at who had been healed really allowed me to to, to experience the integration of what i had been offered in that shamanic teaching and to the extent that now it just deepens and deepens and deepens, and it's an ongoing journey of learning that is really never could have been predicted by the writer and is of incredible sublimity and beauty and humor uh, and love. So, you know, all of it is of a piece, but I, but I offer, you know, the last part that, you know, really doing self-inquiry and pairing it with meditation, I would say, uh, even though we can't separate any of these things out, are, are what's necessary and sufficient to, to this journey. And that, you know, I feel blessed and graced that I was able to be, uh, you know, involved with ayahuasca and with Norma Pandoro, but without the ability to turn around and see who is it that is experiencing this, that I think I would have been in what Jake called earlier a cul-de-sac because I would have kept returning and saying, okay, I need to go back and drink more ayahuasca now. I, I need to learn more what 
the wisdom is, and it's a tremendous path. But insofar as we separate ourselves from that, from ayahuasca or from a teaching, then we're always going to be looking for something, looking at something outside of ourselves for the next clue. Whereas what the ayahuasca was always trying to teach me anyway, if I can be paradoxical, is to look in it myself. So that's all I would share is that what I learned, ironically, from this cosmic teacher was that I needed to look within. And uh, as uh, my practice developed, I ended up meeting Gary and coming into contact with different traditions that focused on that within. So I'm, you know, nothing but grateful for all of it. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank you for that summary. Um, I think we're, we are at the, just about the end here, just almost 930 Eastern time. If you guys wanted to summarize or have anything you'd like to close with to turn it back to you. Persistence. Keep going. It's possible. Awesome. Needed to hear that tonight. Thank you, Rich. Very, Thank you. Very awesome words there and a great way to close here. I'd like to thank Gary, of course, and my colleague Chris and everyone here on this session for your questions. Oh, I see Bradley's here. Wonderful. <laughs> um, just uh, really grateful to everyone here live for your questions and comments and everyone who's connecting via the recording. So we will have the recording out in the next couple of days and we will include the link to the book, which I have here and I'm going to put back in the chat. Again, that is the new book by Gary and Rich, which is, is available or will be available in the next few minutes, <laughs> literally. Um, it's on uh, non-duality press, so that's that link is in the chat. You guys can check that out, and it's based on the book is based on their dialogues. It is their dialogues, so very exciting to have that out in the world. So thank you again, Rich and Gary, and we'll see you guys soon. If you if you could contribute to this, we're going to be giving an email, sending an email out in the next couple of minutes, and I'm going to put a link now to the. Uh, page that we have for uh, making a contribution. It's not required, obviously, that our hosts are kind enough to offer this freely to the community. But if you can make a, a contribution, it does help us pay our bills and, and keep this show going for future episodes. So I'm going to put that link in the chat as well. And with that, we'll uh, say goodnight until the next time. Thanks, everybody.